saturated fat, trans fat, polyunsaturated fat, monounsaturated fat, cholesterol. These are all an example of a broad group of compounds that we call lipids. Lipids are a broad group of natural substances that tend to be nonpolar. Nonpolar meaning that they don't like water. Hydrophobic is the word we use to describe such. And these will include fats, oils, steroids, and phospholipids. The subsequent program on this will look a little bit more at the fats. Anyway, let's look at the functions of these chemicals. First of all, they're used for energy storage. They compact, contain a very compact form of energy per gram, higher than any other. There are chemical messengers, hormones. They offer thermal insulation and organ protection. They're the structural components of the cell, of the cell membrane. And being nonpolar, they're very useful at dividing nonpolar substances. And this would include vitamins like A, D, E, and K. Too much lipid though, however, is not a good thing. An excess of lipids can lead to obesity and atherosclerosis, whereby the lining of the arteries is essentially filled with deposits of fat, restricting the flow of blood, leading to hypertension Now, I want to look a little bit more at the energy content from two perspectives. First of all, let's look at something about their oxidation states. If I consider a carbohydrate, in this case, sugar, when sugar undergoes respiration, it turns into carbon dioxide. And I can see that the oxidation state of carbon has changed from zero to plus four. If I consider a fat, in this case, stearic acid, converting to carbon dioxide, again, it changes to a plus four state. But let's figure out what that initial state is. I'll just let it be X at this point. Set up a little algebraic expression and then solve for X. In this particular case, the oxidation state goes from minus 1.9 to plus four, a change of plus 5.9. This bigger change in oxidation state corresponds to a greater release of energy. We can measure the release of energy also using calorimetry and burning the food. For instance, if I was to take a peanut and burn the oil that's in it, it can then be used to heat water. And measuring the temperature change of that water, I should be able to determine the heat content of that peanut. So let's just go through the math again, very similar to what was done in the enthalpy unit. So I'm going to solve for the heat by looking at the quantity of heat that's absorbed by the water and dividing it by the mass of the peanut that burned. The quantity of heat absorbed by the water is the mass of the water, specific heat of water, and temperature change of that water. And then I'm dividing that by the mass of the peanut that burned. That then gives me the heat per gram. And then I convert that to kilojoules per gram. You'll notice that even though this reaction is an exothermic one, it's not conventional to uh, use negative values when giving the heat content of food, as that would probably just confuse the public. But as mentioned earlier, the heat content of lipids is much higher than any other food source. You've probably come across the terms saturated and unsaturated fats. Let's look a little bit more closely at these terms. I have an example here of a saturated fatty acid. Saturated in that all the bonds, the carbon-carbon bonds, are completely filled with hydrogen. And there you can see the general formula of a fatty acid that is saturated. Down below here, I have an unsaturated fatty acid. In fact, it would be called a polyunsaturated fatty acid because it has more than one double bond in it. Those double bonds could be opened up and could hold more hydrogen, hence the term unsaturated. Consider for a minute, if you will, a little bit about blood chemistry. Blood contains in it two what they call lipoproteins, a high density lipoprotein and a low density lipoprotein. And these have opposing functions. First of all, the low-density lipoprotein carries cholesterol from our liver to our arteries to help protect them and insulate them. Simultaneously, the high-density lipoprotein will carry an excess of cholesterol back to the artery, back from the arteries to the liver. The production of these lipoproteins depends on the foods we eat. For instance, the low-density lipoprotein is enhanced by the consumption of saturated fats. So if we consume more saturated fats, we will essentially be carrying more um, fats from our liver to our arteries. The consumption though of unsaturated fats leads to a reduction of fat in our arteries 
and its movement to the liver. So as you can see, overconsumption of LDLs is bad for us, whereas the consumption of high density lipoproteins and foods that contain unsaturated fats is better for us. A little bit more about this unsaturated fat for a moment. If we count in from the end of the fatty molecule, if we count in three carbons, three from the end, we arrive at a double bond. The Greek letter for the end, or the last letter in the Greek alphabet is omega. So three from the end is called an omega-3 carbon. Six from the end is an omega-6 uh, carbon. At that location, we have a double bond. Those double bonds are sort of unique to the foods that we eat. These come from linoleic acid. We're unable to synthesize this particular acid. We must get it in our diet. It has also been shown that consumption of foods that contain omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids is also good for our production of high density lipoproteins. So keep eating those eggs. Another class within our lipids are the phospholipids, recognized by two long fatty acid chains and a phosphate group. Those long fatty acid chains, consisting of just hydrogen and carbon, are hydrophobic, nonpolar sites. The phosphate group at the end, however, is highly polar and attracted to water. As a result, these molecules can line up with their tails intertwined, their hydrophobic ends facing each other, and their water-soluble sites facing outwards. This is essentially what happens in the cell membrane, where we have water outside the cell and water inside the cell, but it's surrounded by this bilayer of phospholipids that essentially separates or isolates the one environment, the extracellular environment, from the intracellular environment. Lipids are also used to make steroids. In particular, steroids come from the consumption of cholesterol. And here you can see an example of the cholesterol molecule. Steroids all contain this fused ring structure, four fused rings, three of them being hexagons and one pentagon. Most steroids are used for chemical messaging in the body system. We call them stero uh, hormones. For instance, the sex hormones. If we take over here with progesterone in the female and testosterone in the male, we can see the particular fused ring structure. You might also notice they all both finish with O-N-E on the end, the sign of a ketone. And you should perhaps be able to spot the ketone structure in both of those sex hormones. They do differ, however, at one end of the molecule Whereas in the case of testosterone, we have an alcohol group and progesterone, we have a ketone group. You might have heard of things called um, cortical steroids. Cortical steroids are used to stimulate our immune system, prednisone being one of those. And of course, anabolic steroids. Anabolic steroids used in our anabolism to help build up muscle and bone tissue. And of course, their abuse is well noted in the media. Here I have a picture of a molecule called Dianabol. This particular substance was found in the bloodstream of Ben Johnson shortly after he won the Olympic gold medal for Canada. You can see the tremendous similarity between this molecule and testosterone and therefore associate it with the muscle buildup um, that he essentially gained from taking that drug. Again, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to post and thanks again for watching.